Yeah. That's on. That's off. This was Merle Haggard's. Merle Haggard's machine yeah, Merle Haggard for a good 10 years that I know of. I mean, he recorded albums in the late 70s, early 80s on it. So the remote control has to come out here. Yeah. This thing's from 1976, so. Mm -hmm. So we have the shields that come down in order for us to load the tape properly. Well, we've got our reel of tape. Where did you get this? And, um, and is this still is this still being made? The Mtech brand stopped making tape in mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people in the area bought yeah, he bought up everything. all the remaining tape stock because they wanted to remain going on analog as long yeah. as they could. Now there's a company in Germany called RGI which bought the formula for Mtech and they mm -hmm. sell what is called Studio Master 900. Yeah. You need a take up reel. So when I put this reel here, this reel, which is the actual owner ownership yeah. reel gets all the tape. We take this reel here and put our take up reel on the other side. This first is your erase head, a magnet basically mm -hmm. that wipes what's on the tape coming in. So and it first erases every, anything that's on there. Comes in and wipes so that when it starts to record, this is your record head, which actually prints the signal to tape and allows you to monitor that signal at the same time. And later on in the chain, you have your playback head or repro as they call it and this head is what is actually going to give you the tape sound. But it's also 86 milliseconds behind the recording head. So mm -hmm. when you are multi-tracking, you have to constantly use the record head for your monitoring. And when you're done doing your take, you can come in, listen off of the playback head. So constantly switching back and forth between yeah. the playback head and the record head. There's a and switch on the remote control that switches between which head you're monitoring. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to, and we'll hear it and, and when, when we're rewinding and fast forwarding, if I have this head on, you'll hear the noises, what's yeah. on tape getting skewed backwards or forwards. If you're fast forwarding, you hear, you know, like it gets fast, oh, okay. or okay. if you're rewinding. If you're listening to this head, you won't hear that, because this is an input. So there's a constant switch happening on the remote when we're doing a multi-track. Yeah. It gets threaded around. It's all of a series of relays and motors that are constantly monitoring what's going on. There's a tape sensor here. Once you do that, that starts moving on its own. But everything is analog about it. Like even yeah. that, that clicking noise was a relay turning on to tell the motor there to start going. And so when you're spooling up the tape, you actually have some help. Let me get this spooled up. And then from here, you have a torque button. Oh geez. And I have a line marked where my I want to be zero. Get that lined up with the erase head. Yeah. And then that's up. So this is all ready to go. We just talk absolute basics on how this works. How does this tape record sound? Uh, the signal comes in from the inputs of every track. Mm -hmm. Okay, that gets fed into the cards that are down here. Each one of these is for a channel on the tape machine. If there's 16 channels, there'll be 16 cards for record. Do you open this up and plug in the mics? In the front no, here? no, no. You plug in the microphones into preamps, and the preamps get fed into the line inputs that are on the back of the mm -hmm. machine. They're just uh, 25 pin connection yeah. every 25 is eight channels so there's two um, one through eight nine through sixteen this is eight and then this other bank here is nine through sixteen these cards are how you set the and calibrate the machine in order for the levels coming in to be as clean as you want as hot as you want them to be and you basically set it up with oscillators coming out they send a level mm -hmm. to each channel you make sure your record level and your playback levels are calibrated so that when you are recording to tape, you're getting the maximum erase, the lowest possible noise, things that analog did that digital removed, mm -hmm. like noise and the little bit of wow and flutter that happens because it is mechanical. Yeah. So when the weight of the reel on the left side shifts over and it's heavier on the right side, the tape moves slightly different in speed. If it's heavier on the left side versus the right side, it's different. So there's a little bit of what they call wow and flutter that happens on tape. And it's actually pleasing when you hear it. In digital, everything is so precise. Mm -hmm. So it's all ones and zeros. It's either on or off. It's this type of multi-track machine, like when did this become the standard and how long did it stay the standard? The standard of recording on analog started probably in the early 50s. With multi-track recording like this? No, multi-track, the late 50s with Les Paul inventing really the multi-track system. When they were to record to reel to reels, most things were like a single track or two track. Yeah. And that was kind of multi-track. You'd have a left channel, right channel. Um, some of the James Brown recordings, live recordings, would go three track. But they were they, they were always recorded at the same time. They were always recorded yeah. at the same time and always to, um, you know, three machines or two machines mm -hmm. or whatever it was that required you to have them 
synchronized. Yeah. Um, later in the 60s and 70s, they found ways of synchronizing multiple machines. So you could have two 16-track machines connected, and when you recorded on one, it would be recording on the other mm -hmm. as well, so you'd get 32 tracks of analog or you know, more as you started to lock up the machines. Or you would do what they call bouncing down, which would take your you know, 16 and go to maybe two, and then mm -hmm. bring those two back, and then you had 12 or 14 more yeah. to work with. Down here is all the mechanics that run the transport. You'll see like the, that is literally <laughs> just, you know, mechanical. Yeah. When you want it to do its thing, there's relays that tell it what to do. There's a little, like, little piece of steel here that senses when it comes down, so it knows. Um, you know, it's as analog as you possibly could get. God, I can't even imagine the, the resilience of that. How many yeah. times you're doing this. Yeah. And it doesn't break. This thing is from 1976 and it's still doing its mm -hmm. thing. And the spring is still doing its thing. And if this spring gets too loose, you can change it. It interchangeable parts in industrial mm -hmm. revolution right here. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, it was almost like the old computers. They would be this big for like a personal computer. Yeah. Um, this was a DAW. You know, yeah. essentially. But not <laughs> a dog. Uh, it was an awe. Yeah. It was an analog, an analog workstation. audio workstation. Yeah. It's awe. The 16 track world was kind of new in the 70s. That's when they moved from 8 track, which mm -hmm. the Beatles did a lot of after 4 track. Um, it was always multiples of 2 at that point until it got to 8, and then they moved into base 8 math, yeah. where it was 8 track, 16 track, 24 mm -hmm. track, you know, and then you'd had 32 track, you know, like it was yeah. always a bank of 8. So that's why everything in audio started becoming eights. Like your D sub connectors, the 25 pin, it's mm -hmm. eight. Yeah. You know, so you always have one through eight, nine through 16, 17 through 24. That's how this is labeled here. If this was a 24, there'd be a taller meter bridge and there'd be a Another eight. 17 through 24. Yeah. And we move on to the remote here. You know, like I was talking about your input mode, your tape mode, and you'll see the lights on the machine change, you know, to let you know what mode you're in. Just record and play, those things will enable themselves. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I switch between these guys, you'll see that this is telling me I'm monitoring the input, mm -hmm. which one's blue, and it goes off when I'm monitoring tape. And that's a global thing. Yeah, I've noticed in, in my DAW, it does that. It's also kind of funny because in some plugins I have, the plugin looks like this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? we have several. Yeah. That's the biggest thing that analog um, and digital kind of come to a head now. Yeah. Where every plugin in Pro Tools is trying to look like a real piece of gear. <laughs> you know, so that yeah. people go, oh, I've seen that in studios before. Mm -hmm. The important thing to do is to calibrate your remote. When you're winding up your tape and you got your line, then you have to hit reset on the remote so it marks it as zero. So then when you hit location zero, it's always going back to the line. Mm -hmm. Does it ever rip? Uh, you can have tape rip if it's been spliced or if it's really old. Yeah. But for the majority, tape is super strong. It stretches. And this is almost about uh, half a mile of tape right here. Yeah. Finding course, things on so tape without the auto locator would be yeah. almost impossible. Yeah. If I want to go to one minute, I can enter that here and hit locate, and it'll go exactly to one minute. And it'll overshoot a little bit and then finally find its resting place. That's at one minute. Now, if I want to go back to zero, yes. you'll find the line. Yeah. Like, it'll go right back to the line. And then wait. There. Uh -huh. Since this is a half mile of tape, mm -hmm. how, how much audio is that? I guess it depends um, on what speed you're doing. 30 but inches like... per second, you're getting about 16 minutes. Mm -hmm. At 15 inches per second, you'll get about a half hour. Okay. Um, you can go slower on some machines. This one only does either 15 or 30. The slower speed, you don't get as high of a quality, yeah. but you do get a fatter bottom end mm -hmm. because the tape is moving slower. So when you're moving slower, you have more room for the low end to print mm -hmm. in because low end frequencies move slower. Yeah. If you're running at 30 inches per second, you get less noise yeah. and a higher input level. You what, can, what was the standard? And, um, and if you came in here in the 70s to record an album, 15, each, 15 uh, inches per second would be the standard because of uh, songs being so darn long yeah you know like <laughs> think right, about it yeah. yeah you'd have like a nine minute jam okay well if you only have 16 minutes of tape you uh -huh. can only get one and a half of those yeah. on a tape <laughs> what if you wanted to do a second take mm -hmm. you know like if you were running at 15 inches then you're talking about being able to do two full yeah. takes of that nine minute song and even a third take of that mm -hmm. nine minute song and still have three minutes to spare so so if you came in here to do an album would every reel of tape be a new song depends on how many takes of the song yeah um we have 
the awesome old school way of keeping track of things on a track yeah. sheet. <laughs> so all the squares are the tracks of tape. Mm -hmm. You tell every, you know, everybody there would be an assistant or an, another engineer in the room yeah. that would be responsible for this. You write down what take, the start time, the end time, you know, and you keep track. You, you, so someone would say, yeah, we don't have enough to do that take. Mm -hmm. We need to move to a new reel. So you have to keep track highly accurately yeah. so that you don't accidentally cut the end of a song off by running out of tape because mm -hmm. it won't be an undo. Yeah. You don't have that luxury of mm -hmm. you know going backwards on analog. If you missed it, it's gone. Back then, how much would a reel be? Um, I mean, and then, like, price, how much are they now? Price of fish. Uh, uh, how like, much I paying for this today? <laughs> um, that, that because it's a, uh, a you know a reel of, of, of what, well, it's 2,500 feet. Yeah. They're gonna go for about 180 to 220 dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were as expensive as 350 at one point because oh, really? of the scarcity of tape oh. and and the availability. And that was what happened with people buying the hordes of tape when, mm -hmm. when analog in the like early 2000s, there, all the companies were like, we're done, we're done, everything's digital, you know, we don't need to be making two inch tape anymore, or mm -hmm. the formula is too expensive, we can use those machines to do other things, or whatever. Yeah. The case was, all these companies stopped. Yeah, and so I imagine it was really expensive. The price at that point was over $300 a reel. Yeah. In the 70s, similar. it was probably, you know, 50 to 100 bucks, 50. like equivalent pricing. Yeah mid 2000s when digital was kind of taking over prior to that tape was still the format but it was a digital tape yeah so you had uh, super vhs tapes recording you had hyatt tapes recording it was magnetic but it was ones and zeros yeah and then that was kind of the transitional phase mm -hmm. like tape was like okay well i can still serve you but now i'm holding ones and zeros instead of voltage waveforms so when did when did it go to just hard drives and like the, toward the late 2000s late 2000s like, I mean, yeah i started recording maybe in 2004 and i mean it was just small but i've never recorded on anything analog well the other, dash, than, other than the wax there was a series of years where it was analog sounds better digital doesn't sound yeah. good how can i make my digital sound more like analog yeah which is kind of funny like we were saying with the plugins there's a lot of software that mimics what this does mm -hmm. to the sound. This is the biggest thing now is saturation and warmth and all the things that analog gave you already. Yeah. But you are now using digital re reproductions of that mm -hmm. that do a great job. I mean, and to the point where there's A-B tests, you can't tell the difference. Yeah. There is a slight difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear it. And definitely I hear it when I make records on it versus doing nothing but Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason I won't get rid of it. Yeah, I hear I a lot of people still it. use like Am I wrong to say that a lot of people use this for drums? Drums and bass, the... it gets a lot of uh, natural compression, natural saturation, things that you're using plugins in your DAW to do on your mm -hmm. drums and bass. So why not get it on the way in? Mm -hmm. And that's part of what recording engineering should be, is focusing on the sound on the way in so that you're not having to try and make it sound better on the way out. Mm -hmm. If you have it good on tape and you record that into Pro Tools, which is what we end up doing, we use yeah. it as a front end, um, to, to saturate and warm up what we're getting, then it's just the sampler we're doing. We're mm -hmm. sampling the sound being fed to it. And if it's analog, it's gonna sample analog. It requires you to be a better performer. Mm -hmm. There's less crutch. You can't really punch as many things on tape as you can in the digital world. You yeah. can basically fix anything in the digital world. You can make something that never happened happen because mm -hmm. you can grab it from somewhere else and fly it in. Yeah. To do that in the analog world would take multiple machines and people and time like you wouldn't believe but they did it yeah and it was engineering at its height it's more puritan you know like you really had to be professional to do it and mm -hmm. you would get canned for something as simple as i just set this reel of tape on top of that speaker and mm -hmm. now you just erased everybody's yeah. work <laughs> how does this even record a signal like are these playheads just giving stronger voltage or Lower um, voltage, and it's, then it's just, that's recorded. It's variable voltage based on, if you look at a waveform in a digital audio workstation, yeah. you'll see the lines above and the lines below, and they squiggle all the way across the, the... So it's just giving it more or less voltage, and that's being recorded? Except it's magnetic instead of ones and zeros. Yeah. So it literally looks like a waveform going up and down, mm -hmm. like the way you visualize it in Pro Tools, if you zoomed it in to the point where you see yeah. the wave, it's happening like that 30 inches every second. Yeah, yeah, just it's positive and negative voltage, um, which is no different than the way the microphone works. Yeah, your source yeah. goes into the mic and it moves the diaphragm of the microphone backwards and mm -hmm. forwards, and then that creates a voltage output 
of varying frequencies of 20 hertz to whatever, I mean, depending on the microphone, and that gets put down to a medium, whether it be analog tape or ones and zeros in the A to D converter of Pro Tools. Yeah. So you're taking analog and converting it, or you're taking analog and printing it. Is it just every little part of this tape has a certain amount of charge, and this is just no, varying the charge? No, the tape is a magnetic like receiver. In mm -hmm. a sense, there's really no magnetic charge to tape. Yeah, you're magnetically charging the tape with uh, a record head. So is it just is the pushing tape... voltage onto the little segment of the tape? So that thing's segmented 16 times. Yeah. So when I'm recording to track one, I take my preamp up here on the patch mm. bay. I'll plug it into tape one, and whatever I've got going on that microphone into one is making that meter move on one, telling mm. me how hot that signal is coming in and then that's getting pushed onto tape. Yeah. Well, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're manipulating the dynamic range of tape. This Formula 900 had a higher dynamic range than Formula 456 or whatever they had before that, or 499. There were different formulas of tape, and each formula would allow you to push harder, get less noise, get more noise. You know, like if you went with a lower quality formula, you'd get more hiss yeah. because the tape wasn't as high quality. So it's just different grades of the actual like film that it is and how much you can push to it. There's a, a, a thing we use to synchronize tape to Pro Tools called Simpty Timecode, and we'll get into that, but the timecode noise is the equivalent of listening to ones and zeros. Yeah. So like, and I'll play it for you. It's, a, it's like the most annoying sound yeah. you've ever made in your life. <laughs> yeah. But it's telling you where it is, minutes, seconds, frames, subframes, you know, like to the T. So then you can use the two together, which we'll do, yeah. because I want to have tape locked to Pro Tools. You can do overdubs in Pro Tools with things still on tape. You know, and then you can take things off the tape and put them into tools and wipe the tape and use it more. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get into using tape a lot in the studio. I use it as a big front end. It's a piece of hardware that we have down here called the Sync I.O. That is going to send time code to the tape on track 16. Okay. So I use track 16 because it's going to be far away from anything that I'm recording. It's the Society of Motion Picture Television Engineers. That's what Cynthia is. It was this yeah. decision they made of how to make all the machines communicate. And they all were like, well, what if we just gave it hours, minutes, seconds, frames, and subframes, and then everybody knows where everybody is. Yeah. So when you're doing video to audio, you're dealing with empty. That's outputting from the back of this unit, which is just a microphone output, mm -hmm. and going into the tape track of 16. And there it goes. So now track 16 is getting time code. And we wait 16 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta bounce in real time. It's all it's, real time yeah. when you're dealing with analog. You never use the first like 10 or 15 seconds of tape because of that. If you look at what's happened to it, it's, yeah. been, it's been abused. Yeah, you can see some things, you know, like you can almost see through it in places. How similar is this to just like what would be on a VHS tape? Because I do remember VHS tape. It's pretty much the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's just a different thickness and a different formula. You can, and that's how you would do edits. When you wanted to make an edit, you would take your tape, you'd make a mark where you wanted to cut using a china marker, it's just mm -hmm. wax, and then make your cut, and then let it dump, yeah, and then make your cut, and yeah. <laughs> that's the sound of yeah. Sinky. Sounds like we're calling the aliens. And that's hours, minutes, seconds, frames right now. Sorry. So now what I'm doing is taking the output of t time code to the input of the synchronizer, and then it's gonna tell Pro Tools where it's located. Five seconds, six seconds, these are frames. And if I hit stop, that number will stop. Pro Tools is basically a slave to the machine. Now. Yeah. What are we recording today? Uh, first one is just gonna be guitar. So acoustic guitar? Yeah. And the next one should be another acoustic guitar. The ACG2. And then we're gonna need acoustic guitar three. Bass, bass. yeah, and bass, we have a washboard. I don't know if we're gonna use it, but we have a washboard. We'll skip some tracks and put a washboard over here so that if you do want to add other things, you can. And that's what you have to kind of plan out, like where you're going to put things. Mm -hmm. cool. There's going to be two vocal tracks. There you go. So then 13, 14. Mm -hmm. 